Welcome back everyone. After some time thinking about it and some serious consideration, I'm sad to say that we decided to sell our Tesla Model S. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking about exactly the reasons why we decided to sell it. So stick around. So it really wasn't even that long ago that I posted a video about our experience owning a Tesla Model S for the period of time we had had it. And just to recap real quickly, that was a 2014 Tesla Model S that we had bought. There was just a series of things with the car that I'm gonna talk about in this video. And again, just bear in mind that this was a used Model S. Not just that it's used, but that it was quite old. The 2014 is only, I think, like the second model year that the Model S was in production. So I do just wanna say upfront that even though I'm gonna talk about some of the problems we had with the car, I'm not trying to say anything bad about Tesla. So just want to say that up front, we enjoyed the car very much and that video that we posted before explained the reasons why we liked it. This video is going to be more about the problems we had. The first repair I think that we had done, it was a mobile repair and mobile tech showed up and it was just a recall. It was an airbag recall that I think affected a lot of different companies and brands of cars. So not just Tesla. Um, and talking about recalls, this isn't necessarily the order that things happen, but since we're talking about recalls already, there was another one that had to do with the EMMC chip, I think is what it's called. Basically just kind of like the brains behind uh, the screen. I'm not really sure if it controls like, you know, all the different functions of the car, but I think it was called the EMMC chip. Anyway, this was something that was starting to lag uh, after a bunch of software updates. People were just seeing like slower response times, the car taking longer to boot up. So I did it and I actually regret it. I don't know if anyone else has had this experience, but the issue actually got worse for us. Uh, the boot up screens uh, delaying or just being gray or black, you know, with the Tesla logo was happening like all the time now, especially the screen right behind the steering wheel. That used to always boot up like immediately, no problem, you immediately see the car information. And ever since we did the recall, it got worse. But again, that recall didn't cost anything. Um, the very first thing that we had to get, uh, not repaired, but I guess replaced, and that cost us money, and it was totally our fault on us. I've never had this happen before, but uh, the key fob, I put it on top of the car, I think, while I was loading something into the vehicle, and so somewhere along the way that key fell off, and I think we were actually able to find it, or my wife found it when we were looking for it on the way back, and it was demolished, so we had to pay for that to get fixed. I think it was like $165. So again, that was on us, that was our problem, but this is really just starting a series of events that by the end kind of lead me to believe that the car felt a little bit cursed in a way. Um, so that was the first thing we had to pay for. It wasn't fun, but it was handled uh, relatively quickly. And I think for that, we did have to go to the service center and that took some time. Um, while it was in the service center for that, we did do a tire rotation and that only cost $40 to do a tire rotation, which again, I was you know, pleasantly surprised that it wasn't super expensive. You can get tire rotations done a little bit cheaper, but 40 bucks again, still seemed like a good price. The next thing we had to repair uh, was the 12 volt battery. This is, you know, under the hood, not obviously the battery of the car, but just the 12 volt battery. And this was another mobile visit. So, you know, a technician came to us, which was nice, but we did have to pay for it and probably should have expected this to happen sooner or later for a car that was so old. Um, something that was present even in the video we did before uh, was the yellow screen, uh, just these yellow spots on the screen that were there from the moment that we bought the car. And uh, there are issues of this that have been reported and they, they're able to fix it sometimes when it happens like on the edge of the screen, I think. But in this case, even the technicians that would see it were like, I don't know why there's these two yellow screens that look like in high touch point areas, even they seem kind of bewildered by it. So. Uh, the, the screen always functioned perfectly. It was purely a cosmetic issue and it never seemed to get any worse. The big thing that had me worried was when the air suspension started acting funny. So not all Tesla Model S's have this summer coil suspension and ours was the smart air suspension. It just kind of like adapts the height uh, of the car based on how fast you're going. And it started to, I came into the garage one day and the car was just entirely lopsided to one side. I could see the, the, the pressure was up and normal on one end and on the other side it was just like it had lowered somehow in the course of the night. Drive the car and it would auto level itself and, and, and then it didn't happen all the time but man like just those couple instances I was like this is a problem that I feel like is going to be really expensive to fix. I could be wrong I never researched but I was starting to worry 
that, okay, this air suspension goes out. This seems kind of like a major repair and that part is not covered by the warranty. Um, as we get into more issues that were are functional, these are the things that kind of were bothering us about the car, even from the beginning. And, you know, maybe I should have mentioned them in the first video we did, uh, but they seem like small gripes at the time. But over a period of time, it, it, it became just more annoying. And these are things that, again, are just the design of the car. So I'm going to start with the handles. These are the auto present handles that, you know, they, they pop in and out. Uh, you know, depending if you're needing to get in the car, they sense your presence or what they're actually sensing is the key fob being in close proximity. Uh, and, and so the issues here are twofold. First of all, we live in Texas and these handles are, you know, some type of metal because they get really hot uh, when they're in direct sunlight. Like you can't even like, like you're grabbing your shirt to try to, cause you can't keep your hand on it for more than like a second and a half before you're like feeling the pain of the burn. And I think this is really interesting. Uh, they just might've chosen the wrong material for this. Uh, I've never had a car whose handles, uh, you know, my Nissan Leaf, I remember had silver, you know, chrome looking handles. Maybe they're just made out of plastic versus metal or aluminum on the Tesla, but I mean, these Tesla ones just got really unbearably hot if you left it parked outside in direct sunlight. Um, just seemed kind of like an oversight design-wise. May not affect people that aren't in hot areas, but here in Texas, it was definitely a recurring issue. The other part of the handles is the auto present feature, which is nice when you want it to happen, namely when you're entering the car. Oh, the handle comes out for you, nice. But anytime, you know, the car is parked in the garage, and any time I walk out there, if I have the fob on me, because, you know, I'm going to another car. We had two cars at the time. So I'm walking to the garage to get into the other vehicle, not the Tesla. And I have all my fobs on the same keychain. And it always turns on the Tesla. It would always, the handles would come on. It's just a small gripe maybe, but I got so tired of like, first it used to startle me. Like I'd forget that like it's going to, it makes this light kind of a uh, noise. And uh, I just wish that maybe it was like less sensitive maybe you could get a little closer uh, without the handles auto presenting but that was an annoyance and another thing even tied into that is that sometimes if the handle has been out for a few seconds you know it's probably time a timing thing where it's going to retract automatically if no one's opened the door which is what happens i go to the other car the tesla thinks i'm going into it i drive away and then the handles you know retract but even when we are going to the tesla and we've waited a few seconds the handles will just kind of go back in and there's been times that, you know, our fingers, we, we pull our fingers out real fast because when it pulls in, it doesn't seem to stop. It doesn't seem to sense that like your hands there and pressure of holding it. Like, it's just like, nope, we're closing and you have to uh, get them to come back out again. Seems kind of dangerous. I don't know. I'm sure it's designed. It's not going to crush your fingers. At least I hope not. But the feeling is that that's what's going to happen. And so you instinctively like pull your fingers out. And like, we were worried about our kids getting their fingers stuck in there too. Um, another issue related to the door was something that uh, there's, there's two more issues with this. One was that the back left door um, doesn't matter what door it is, but in our case, that's the door it was. And it would uh, just when we were not when we were driving, but if we would park, I guess it kind of was triggered by the handles uh, when they would come out. So we're parking somewhere, we're either at home or we're somewhere else. And when the handles come out, the door would open like it would dislodge not open all the way but just enough to where you know it breaks the seal um, and you can tell the door is open and that happened quite a bit and it would just happen on and off very strange and we kept ignoring it because we didn't want to pay to to fix it and it really is probably just a handle situation and so speaking of the handle breaking another door had the actual you know i knew these cars were famous for the handles uh you know motors like going out and uh, you know they just don't open or they don't function properly and I thought maybe because two owners before us had owned this car, I was like, maybe they've already repaired that. Maybe those issues are already taken care of. But we did wind up with uh, the passenger front door uh, not working. The handle would come out, but you pull it and like it, it wouldn't open the door. Nothing, nothing was happening. So we did get that repaired. And uh, then that was a mobile tech thing. So about $300 for them to come out, fix the handle. And uh, that worked fine after they fixed it but again you know three hundred dollars later another part was with the the car i don't know the tesla just operates differently i don't know if newer ones are like this but it's like if the doors are closed and no one's in the car it turns off great 
except that sometimes someone was in the car, in the front passenger seat, and it wouldn't seem to know they were there. I assume these are all sensors that are in the seat. It, you know, determines whether someone's there and, you know, whether to keep the car on or off. And so there'd be times that I would be driving with my wife, park, we want to keep the AC on, you know, it's hot in Texas, hot summer, just like it is right now. Um, no one's sitting in the car without the AC blowing. I go inside, close the door, the whole car turns off, even though she's still inside. Um, and even worse was when I was driving by myself and I'm running errands. So sometimes I'm just going to, I sell stuff online a lot, so I go to the post office. I don't know, people may not go to the post office that often, but it's really quick. You have a pre-labeled package, you run inside, so I'm only there for like 20 seconds. So I get there. I don't want the car to turn off. I want the AC to keep going. I'm going to be, I'm going to be coming right back out, but I could not find a way to get the Tesla to do this because if I'm not in the car and no one's in the car, I close the door and it turns the car off and it turns the AC off when I really want the climate controls to stay. With my Nissan Leaf, this was really easy and, and like the Nissan Leaf was, was several years old, that first generation Leaf, so I don't know why a Tesla that cost over $100,000 when it was first purchased in 2014 can't do what my 2015 Nissan Leaf could do, which was anytime I'd go to a gas station and get like uh, some breakfast uh, and I want to leave the car on and I'm just going to be there for a few minutes and I can see it like from inside the store. Uh, I used to be able to close the Leaf doors, press lock on the outside, uh, you know, handle, driver's handle, and it would lock the car. So it's on, but it's locked and the, and the, and the AC is still going, but the Tesla never seemed to do that. So my practice used to be to just leave the door slightly ajar so that the AC would keep going. It just seemed really strange that I had to find that kind of workaround. And then there was this night where I walk into the garage and I see light coming from the Tesla's center screen and the screen is just changing colors from like white to gray and then like red, green, and blue just over and over in this sequence. And I tried to make a service appointment using the app and they just rejected and canceled it because they said they didn't know what this was, but they didn't think it was a serious issue. So it was things like that. And again, uh, the, the impending air pressure system from the smart air suspension was kind of where we were like, okay, we need to get rid of this thing uh, before, before we end up paying a bunch more money. So it was decided that we were going to sell the car. Used car prices were at an all-time high. I'm like, okay, let's do this. And uh, we weren't sure if we were gonna replace it or try to get away with one vehicle for a while. But um, regardless, the night we had decided, my wife and I, that we were gonna sell it, the next morning, driving out to take my kids to daycare, pulling out backwards out of the garage. And we have a garage where it's, you know, it's two slots, but there's a barrier in the middle. Um, and uh, we left the door open and I didn't realize it was open, backed up, <laughs> bent the door, you know, backwards, the opposite way it's supposed to go. Uh, and yeah, that was the day we thought we were going to list the car for sale and then we damaged it. So that wasn't fun. And again, that comes back on us. That was our fault. But that was definitely where we felt like, okay, we feel like the car is cursed. It just keeps having problems. And again, to compare it to previous EV purchases, we never had these issues with our Nissan Leaf, our Chevrolet Volt, and uh, both our Leafs, they were both 2015s, and now our Outlander PHEV, which we've done a video about as well. None of these cars have had issues, only the Tesla. And it's just so sad that the car that was the most fun to drive, that was the most luxurious, is the one we ultimately had to sell or decided to sell based on both repairs and things that were costing us money that we kept feeling like we were shelling out money to, to fix this car and just functional issues like the doors auto present or the handles auto presenting when you don't want to. And just kind of felt like this constant worry that what's gonna go wrong next. So we did ultimately sell the car. We sold it on Vroom, which is a platform that I, I had never experienced before. I think I'm gonna actually do a video about that. Um, maybe some of y'all have been looking at cars and, and found them on Vroom. It's kind of like a CarMax or Carvana. You know, it's, it's an online, you buy them online. So stay tuned for an episode in the future. I think I might talk about our experience doing that. But yeah, we sold the car to, to Vroom. Uh, they gave us a nice trade-in for just like 5,000 less than we had paid for the car when we got it like over two years prior. So. Definitely was a bonus getting a, or selling the car during high used car values, a, a time when uh, you can get the most back. Uh, but also the point was to not buy another car. So right now we're currently down to one vehicle and making it work. 
Um, and it did take quite some time to get the car repaired. We obviously had to fix that door that we bent backwards and that took over a month uh, to get done. And it was interesting not having driven the Tesla for that period of time and having decided to sell it. As soon as I picked the car up from the collision company, by the way, Tesla doesn't do their own collision repairs. You have to use like a, another collision company that is Tesla certified, which I didn't know. It's interesting. Um, once that all got taken care of and it was done really well, by the way, looked like nothing ever happened. I took that drive back home and I got so sad immediately. I, I started to feel and remember the spunkiness of the Tesla and all the things that I did like about it, the luxurious ride, this long distance vehicle that we just weren't using for that. We weren't using the free supercharging. We weren't driving it the way that I'd always intended. It wasn't our family car anymore, even though it is spacious enough to be a family car. Um, we weren't using the free, uh, uh, supercharging uh, the free data here's another issue uh, that happened more recently uh, with the data connectivity we were going to lose that um, there's a modem that had to be replaced because that car is old enough that it was a 3g modem and so obviously we're into 5g now but you have to upgrade to 4g because AT&T was phasing out 3g towers and the car was going to lose service so that was another thing we had to pay for like the car was so old that we needed a new modem so that we could get 4g uh, connectivity. So again, there were just things that kept stacking up. And again, no other car we'd owned, um, electric car, had these kind of issues. So maybe people who own newer Teslas don't have these same things pop up so often. Plus you're covered by that warranty period, which we were not able to really enjoy on this Tesla. Uh, yeah, it was just sad to see it go. I really was kind of almost regretting it as we were seeing it go off, uh, taking the broom guys, taking it away. Uh, and you know, but I know it's the right decision. And so again, we're down to that one car and it's been the right decision for us for now. I am looking forward to owning a Tesla again in the future. I've got that cyber truck reservation down. A lot of y'all might have cyber truck reservations too. Wondering when that truck is ever actually going to come out. But until then, that seems like realistically the next Tesla I might possibly consider or a Tesla model Y if they reintroduce the rear wheel drive version that they had up for a while and then got rid of but the Teslas are just getting more and more expensive. They have so much demand that they have the ability to just keep increasing prices to try to lower demand. So I don't see a Tesla in our future for now. Don't really see myself purchasing another used one based off our experience. And uh, yeah, so just wanted to share this with you guys. Definitely not trying to bash Tesla here and certainly not trying to dissuade you from buying a used electric vehicle. Almost every electric car we have owned has been used and um, the Tesla was really the only one that had issues that kept creeping up and repairs that kept needing to be done. So anyway, hope you all enjoyed this video, found it informational. Again, stay tuned in the future, probably going to do a video about working with Vroom and what that was like, doing a trade-in and a purchase through them. And uh, yeah, we'll be talking about that in the near future. So thanks for tuning in today, guys, and I will see you in the next episode. <music>